Yeah, we're recording now. Yeah, how many people did you have sign up, Craig? You know? A lot. A lot. Okay. Not all of them are all our clients too. A lot of our industry trainers will be joining us, and I think here they come. So, all right. Nice. A lot. Yeah. A lot. That's always a good. Lot. A lot. Yes. A lot is a good number. Yep. That's a good number. Um, I, hey, I me, like me and Chris, uh, we wanted to make a real quick request to, to you, you and, and Colin. Could y'all just for this webinar change your name to Chris? Well, <laughs> uh, it's you already got the C in the name. Just a couple more letters. I think right. If Colin and I keep our names, it'll be easier. <laughs> Chris number one, two, three, and four. So depending right. on how you're looking at the box, could be Chris one, two, three, and yeah. four. It would I actually think it'd make it easier. Because that way when I when I refer to somebody, I can always say, Well, Chris, this is what I'm thinking. I right. had another <laughs> idea. If you guys are comfortable sharing your middle names. <laughs> I know, I know Cloutier's, I can tell you that one. I'm, I'm fine sharing my middle name, but I, again, I rather, I, people have called me Cotton, Cotton Balls, um, Peter Cottontail, like I got it all in grade school, right? Nice. Yeah. Nice. Mine was Neil. So the joke, the unrunning, and I, I'm, I'm going to, you know, Brandon Crush is on here, so I probably should not say this because there's going to be some people that I will hear this uh, repeating in a loop for now and forever. And they would say, Christopher, kneel before me. Uh. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, but when you're a kid and you're having problems with acne and fitting in, uh, <laughs> somebody saying Christopher Neal before me, uh, <laughs> what did he just say? Oh, and then we got Peter on there too. Yeah, I'm a Clucci <laughs> deal. Yeah. I'm, All yeah, right. I'm well, guys, it's two o'clock. So we're going to dive into this topic. We're going to meet the remote advisor and we have a great panel today. I'm Craig O'Neill. I'll be hosting this panel discussion with me today is Chris Cloutier. Chris Cotton and Colin Watson. Guys, go ahead and introduce yourself. I want you to just tell us a little bit about who you are, why you're on the panel. Colin, we're going to start with you. Oh, great. Start with me. Yeah. Uh, my name is Colin Watson. I'm a service advisor at Golden Rule Auto Care. Uh, started with Chris 11 years ago there. We started up, took over an existing business, turned it into what it is with uh, obviously Chris and his brother Pat's driving force. Uh, we took a shop that was down in the dumps and built it up to what it is now. And uh, yeah, kind of been one of the testers for auto text me for years as well. Nice. <laughs> well, that's a good segue for Chris Cloutier. Yes. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Thank you, Craig. Chris Cloutier, own Auto Text Me and own two auto repair shops, Golden Rule Auto Care in Dallas, Texas. I'm glad to be a part of this panel. Exciting topic um, to talk about, uh, you know, remote service advising. As you know, Craig, I like to talk technology, and especially when it's scary. Um, so I think this is one of those <laughs> topics that's scary, um, but I think we're going to have a lot of good information for, for a lot of people in this, in this topic. So, and then thank you, Chris Cotton for joining us. This is awesome. Hey, no problem. So uh, coach Chris Cotton here from auto fix auto shop coaching. Um, you know, it shouldn't, it, it is scary, but mainly because we're all older, right. And we're, we're scared of something new, but there were a lot of lessons from COVID. And I really think that this lesson really got pushed forward because of COVID um, and, and all the technology that's coming out, what Auto Text Me is doing, what I'm doing with ServiceUp uh, is just really amazing. And, you know, I started remote coaching 10 years ago and, you know, I still have people that don't know what I do and don't understand it. So, so we, we got to talk about it. We got to get in forums like this and be like, like, Hey, this is what we're doing. And so um, I'm here to normalize 280 pounds and I'm here to normalize um, uh, the remote service advisor space. Oh, awesome. I, I just want to comment on that. I mean, it's, it, you're absolutely right. As we get older, you know, I find myself yelling at the neighborhood kids, tell them to get off my damn lawn. <laughs> so yes, we don't like change or people on our yards. Right. Well, Colin, now that you're home, you can see if there's kids on your lawn. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> my dog will alert me. And hopefully I'd I'm like to video know. presentation at that time. Yeah. What I'd like to know and what I'd like our audience to hear from you on is what prompted this move part time from the Golden Rule Auto Care counter to, well, essentially your kitchen counter, your home office. Absolutely. That's yeah, a great question. So um, I'm, I'm married. I've got kids and my wife's a very career driven individual. Um, she's in the healthcare industry. Well, she finally moved into the executive side of the world where her job was more demanding of her hours. She didn't quite have as much free time to pick up kids, drop kids off. Um, as she used to do, that used to be her role for the first I don't know, 10, 10 years or so. It was always her taking care of that. And I was always focused at work. 
Well, she got in a position where that was her focus had to be at work. Therefore, mine had to go back to the family. Mm. And that's when I approached Chris and go, hey, here's my life situation's kind of changed here. I've got to kind of reduce some hours. Um, you know, obviously I've been here since the beginning. I don't want to leave, um, but I've got to do something. And here's kind of my parameters and, you know, kind of the roadblock or roadblock or speed bump that I've kind of come across here. And then that's when we kind of brainstormed and Chris kind of pitched this and voila, here we are. Now, Chris Cloutier, you've had the idea of a remote advisor for a while anyway. This sort of pushed your hand a little sooner than expected. Yeah, Craig. So in Texas, believe it or not, every once in a while, we get ice and snowstorms. When they do happen, they shut down the city dramatically. But they also, I mean, we're not equipped for ice and snow. Um, so in the past, we've tried to do this when we could get some techs in and, you know, some people have got in, some people can't, we can make it optional when, when people can make it in. So we've, we've tried to do this remote service advising. Um, and then at this point in time, when Colin came to me, I said, you know, here's it, this is our chance to try something that I've always wanted to do. It's hard, uh, for me, it was hard for me as an owner, because when somebody starts working from home, you know, that everybody else is going to go, well, what to be about me? <laughs> Why can't I work at home? Um, so this has given us, it's kind of a good situation, a bad situation because our hand was kind of forced. Of course, we could have had Colin part-time, but this allows him to go home, us to totally try this model, to leverage his experience, and then also to allow him to, you know, be at home when his kids come in. So I think it's kind of the best of both worlds where versus us still trying to get him to come in and drive. I mean, so far it's working really well. I, I would say okay. it, it's working swimmingly well. Yes. So, so Chris Cotton, now we've heard from a long-term employee, we've heard from an owner and the, how they had to come to an arrangement to, to make something work. Long-term employee doesn't want to leave. Owner, at least this one anyway, is mindful of the future and open to change. Is this something you've seen a lot of other shop owners open to or do they end up losing a staffer? Um, it, I, I am seeing that and I'm glad that they were able to work it out because who wants to lose somebody with that much experience just because of a life change situation? Mm -hmm. So um, I, my guess is, is Colin probably thinks a little bit more of, of, uh, golden rule auto because they were able to, to, to mold and adapt and, and move forward. A lot of what we're seeing is shops that are too busy. Um, and, and let's face it, right? Like auto, auto repair shop owners have a poor track record of, of training people and putting them in the best spot to succeed, both for the business and themselves and the customer, right? Like, so, so they'll hire somebody, be like, there's the phone, there's your stuff, good luck. I got stuff to do, or I'm hitting the golf course or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, and so with, with the amount of business that, that everybody's seeing now, some people have outgrown their shops or, you know, if we're talking about car count and being able to, to handle the car count and then the call volume and social media, some people don't have a place to put those people. So, so we're seeing, we're seeing people run out of space and they're like, well, what do we do? You know, do we, do we have, do we, do we let this happen? Do we do this? And that's kind of where we come up with service up as part of our models. We do that for you um, and then help you with that. But there's all kinds of, you know, instances where this could work. Well, let me add too, Craig. I mean, it's, there's not, this isn't a surprise. We're still having problems finding people and good people. Yeah. You know, there, there's still a crunch in our market. Um, I'm a part of many different owners groups. And in one of them, somebody stated uh, that, man, I never had a problem before finding somebody for the counter. And now I'm struggling to find people for the counter. And Chris, I'm sure you know this, uh, as you work with service advisors, to train a good service advisor who has the depth of knowledge to be able to price out the ticket, the job and the labor, it's not three months. It's not six months. So you're absolutely right. Colin has 11 years of building tickets and this ability. He knows the parts. He knows the add-ons. He knows the, so just the training alone to get that person, once you get that person, takes a long time to get that, that experience and that understanding inside of them. Yeah, and if I can interject there. So a great example of what you're talking about is uh, Chris's brother, Patrick's the master tech that started the shop with Chris. And I was about a year and a half in. I thought I was pretty good, right? Yeah, I know what I'm doing. I can talk to customers. I can sell jobs. I know how to get parts all good. We're all that way. And Pat came to me and Pat goes, dude, it takes five to 10 years to make a service advisor a good service writer. Yep. I was pissed. I was offended. <laughs> I was butthurt. I was mad because I thought I was good. Mm -hmm. Now at 11 years in, 100% it takes five to 10 years. There's so much knowledge that you have to gain on this side. Technicians respect. I mean, 
You yeah. know, I've gone to where I pushed myself to make sure I wasn't just service advisor, that I go out there and diagnose cars. I have the ASC certifications. I have the knowledge. So when I was talking to a customer, I could explain that to them and really make them understand that. But a year and a half in, no. I was a phone answerer and a parts guy. I, yeah. I was We're not a takers. service advisor. I thought I was, what? but I was not. What, what I, what I like, how I like to say that is you're a blue belt in a room full of black belts, right? Like, you know, just enough to get your ass kicked at that point. And, and that's, <laughs> that's it. That's beautiful. That's yeah. a great we're analogy. Good, we're good in the uniform, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Like, who are you going to go up to and be like, oh, I'm going to conquer you today. Like, no, like, sit down, kid. It's not going to happen. Yeah. It's, it's me. And I think, I think that's great. Like realizing that is a, is a big part of, of, and then too, you know, it's always learning. It's always growing. One of the good things that we've been able to do um, is, is it's been easy, quote unquote, to find remote service advisors. Like I could throw up a remote service advisor ad today and probably get 130 applicants versus if I was in, um, you know, Bowie, Texas, looking for a service advisor, I could, I could probably get 20 people to apply, but two of them might be kind of qualified, like they might, might start, but actually to come in and do a good job, if we're talking about somebody that needs to come in and hit the ground running, um, and you can be a little bit more picky that way if, you, if you're able to open it up. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and yeah. having somebody at the counter, like Colin said, so this opens up the possibility for the CSR, which you know this term gets kicked around a lot, right? This customer service representative that you can have that is great at answering phones. They're great at taking orders. They're great at writing down the issues with the customer. They're great at checking customers out. Um, I think this opens the door, right? Because, you know, and we'll get into it later, you know, Colin's a machine when it comes to building tickets and when it comes to sourcing parts and when it comes, and that's a lot of time, at least in my shops, in our structure, we don't have the techs do it. We have the service advisors build the tickets. Well, and this is getting to the mechanical components of how Colin can do his job at home too, because there's that customer service relationship. At most. There's a relationship business. We all use that phrase all the yes. time and it's true. So Colin being one step removed, how's that being addressed in the shop right now? And Colin, does that affect uh, your ability to do anything on the ticket? No, it doesn't really affect too much. And that's because of the technology we have. Um, like one thing with auto text me, there's a chat function down there. So if a technician, I'm looking at the DVI and he says, you know, this T connector over here is not there and I can't find it on the schematic and I don't have a good enough picture. I can just open up that chat function. Hey, can you get me a better picture of that? And they'll shoot that right over. And that cares out of my text or anything else. I'm able to use that chat function, which helps kind of bridge that gap of any openings of, because unfortunately not all the texts are going to take the best pictures and have the best write-ups every time. <laughs> well, um, and so, what? Sorry, go, go ahead. What? <laughs> <laughs> so, so the big, you know, one of the things that, that we're talking about here is increasing productivity too, because, because if Colin can sit at home and if he did nothing all day, but write up estimates and, and send it back to somebody in person or was able to text those out and say, Hey, look at this. Um, you know, one of the, one of the positions that we're working in some of the shops now is like a full-time estimator, somebody that just sits back in a room yep. and, and just writes up estimates and tickets and looks up parts and then says, okay, service advisor, here's this ticket, present it. Um, but that part that, but because, because everything we have now, that person doesn't have to be in a, in an office or whatever. They can be at home. Um, yeah. Spot on. Now, digital inspections being a component of things yeah. too. Colin, is that sure. generally where your job really kicks into gear? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm following it. I see when the technician moves it over and it goes into the estimating function at that point, I can grab it. And I've also now I've got a service advisor in each store and both because I build tickets for both stops. That also allows me to do that for both of them. I have, you know, both operating systems up, both auto text me's up. So I'm able to go between the two of them and there'll be a service advisor there that'll text me, hey, estimate 68458 is ready. At that point, most of the time I've already started it because I'm kind of watching the board. So I'm kind of starting to build it. And then once I know it's confirmed, then I can transfer all the notes and go from there. But yeah, the digital, I mean, it's completely digital. There's very wait, little- Wait, wait, wait one second though, because you said something pretty cool now, and I don't want anyone to miss this, but you're actually receiving it for two locations. Right. Correct. That, that allows me to build tickets for both shops as needed. And then kind of drawing back a little bit to the productivity, I live about 30 minutes away from each shop. So you're gaining an hour of productivity from me because I'm not having to drive to a shop as well. So that kind of opens up the time that I'm available to be able to build tickets as well. But yeah, being able to build tickets for both shops remotely, it helps. It and helps I want to piggyback on what Chris said, that whole, you know, this is what we got to get to, right? This productive and efficient level. And this is what we're all trying to get to, right? So Colin doesn't, you know, 
day to day, and we talk about this all the time, you know, with Autotext Me and the, the shops we talk to, right? I mean, part of technology helps you leverage to where you can engage the customer without being interrupted during the day or throughout the day. But your service advisors, they sit there, they're getting interrupted by the phone, by the customer in front of them, by the technician coming in and ask, standing behind them until they acknowledge that they're there, by the owner who's yelling and saying, why isn't this ticket, you know, why didn't we sell this? So Colin being remote has absolutely increased his productivity 10 times when it comes to building a ticket, right, Chris? So I think that's a great point, right? Because this is his task that he's focused on. And I saw this Rui, Rui Martin, I know he's been uh, putting some yeah. things in there. And he said, yeah, you, so the, in order for this to work, you have to have a strong person. Colin's been with us 11 years. He's a, Colin knows writing, he's our best ticket writer by far, best estimator that we, one of the best, but we have another guy, Graham, who's the manager at the other shop that's really yeah. proficient as well. But Colin definitely is one of our top guys for this, for sure. Well, yeah. and not, and not to get too much in the future, because I know we're already talking about a lot and everybody's like, oh my God. Um, I'm working with a couple of shops where we don't answer any inbound phone calls. Nice. Interesting. So, so, so if you were to wow. call one, of, if you were to call one of these shops up, the, the message is something like, Hey, thanks for calling, um, cotton's auto repair. We're busy with another customer right now. If you want to text us, you can text this number. If you want to email us, you can email this number at the end of this message. There will not be an opportunity for you to leave us a message. Please text us or email us. And, and there, and then that's it. There's no beep. And then people text, they email. Um, we have people on staff that text and email back and it's huge, but it's, it's, it's like the old days of where we're trying to do like appointment cards, right? Like the dentist office, like you had to get that. And I dare say that you guys have your processes and procedures on point or else you wouldn't be able to do what you do. Correct. Um, and so for all shop owners that want to do this, you've got to get the processes and procedures in place in order to make this work. But um, you know, we're at this point, we're retraining our customers and some of them are going to embrace it. And some are going to go kicking and screaming and you just have to figure it out. Well, Chris, you've talked about service up a few times. We haven't really defined yeah. what that is. Uh, service up, I think is kind of fits into this part of the conversation really neatly because we are training a different service model for the client right. side of things. How does service up work and what is it? So, so kind of just to give you an idea of where my mind was when I found service up like a year ago, um, I have a daughter, she's 19, she's off at college. Um, you know, I've always had my own repair shop. Mm -hmm. I've always had a great relationship and was able to send her to, but if my 19 year old could, could magically get on an app and put in a request and somebody would schedule a pickup and come pick up her car, take it to a shop, send her a DVI. Um, she could approve it, then get the fi finished invoice, and it would magically reappear back in her driveway. She would be all in on that because the <laughs> because because she's Gen Z. The fewer people she talks to in the day, the better off she is. And so if I'm looking at the future of auto repair and everything, I'm like, well, this is where we're headed. And so how do we get there? So I spent two or three years talking to people be like, Hey, I have an idea for an app. Um, but I don't know what that entails, anything else. And everybody like basically patted me on the head, like I'm a puppy dog and said, Chris, that's a great idea, but it'll never work. And, and so like a year ago, I ran across service up was introduced and I told them what my idea was. And they're like, well, we're working on similar things to that, but we have, and, and let's face it in the tech space, you start out with this idea and in the last 12 months, we're like here now, like we've just taken off with all the other stuff we're doing. So, you know, we're, we're building a solution um, to do uh, things that shop owners struggle with as far as like customer acquisition, technology, staff, scheduling. How do we schedule and be more productive? Like in our app, um, you, you can sign up as one of our customers and, and in the app, if you want, you can get a shop code. And you can share that with all your customers and they can interface you directly with the app and you can pull it up on the dashboard and then communicate with them again, without answering the phone and things like that. Um, but would that be an employee of the shop or is this somebody like Colin that's simply a service up advisor or something in that? Um, that would be, that would be an employee of the shop that would be handling that part yeah. of it. And so, 
So we're in the San Francisco Bay Area now. We're in Phoenix. We're getting ready to soft launch Denver, um, Las Vegas, West LA, Orange County. And by the end of the year, we'll be in 25 different places in the model I'm getting ready to tell you about. So in this other model, um, our partner shops, um, people schedule through the app. Our remote service advisor figures out where they're at, figures out which partner shop is the best for them. Then we have our driver go out, pick that car up, deliver it to the shop. We interface with the shop and then we invoice the customer and take care of all of the customer side of the business. And then when we're done, we deliver that car back to the customer. And, and we've gone, you know, we've picked up at offices. Uh, we had a guy that thought it would be cool to have the, his car delivered at a party. So we delivered it back to a party with 40 people. And the next thing we know, we've got like 40 people around and he's talking about how cool it is. Um, you know, and, and just let's set aside our productivity for a minute, but really we're also helping people be more productive in their lives. We're helping um, uh, virtual assistants. We're helping uh, soccer moms. We're helping doctors, lawyers. We're, you know, people that work remote like me. Like if I stop doing what I'm doing to go to town and get my oil changed, it costs me money. So, so why not be able to go, um, uh, to go into the app and schedule service and do the whole thing from here and not, and not have to do that. So we're doing tons of great stuff. Um, and again, like everything we're doing is advancing so fast. It's insane. And I'll shut up for a minute. No, no, that's, that's interesting. <laughs> it's now, good stuff. When I hear about this sort of thing, I'm thinking of, wow, the technology, the equipment that's needed and everything else. Is, is this something that it's hard to get people for? Like, let's Colin, let's go back to you for a moment with your role. What do you need to do it successfully? The bare minimums. Bare minimum is an internet connection, laptop. All of our software is all uh, web-based. So, I mean, and then earbuds. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the basic now. Having a nice dual screen monitor definitely, you know, speeds up productivity, work on the laptops a little bit more uh, time consuming than the bigger display. But bottom line, all you really need is a laptop, a good internet connection, and earbuds. Well, Which opens and, the talent pool up tremendously is what I'm hearing. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so, so here's like a caution though, like say, and we'll ask Call on this, like when, whenever, Whenever you transition from going to the office every day to work to going home, you know, I've been doing this for 10 years and that was a huge thing for me. I'm used to getting up, showering, cup of coffee, getting dressed, going to the service counter and interacting with people all day. And I went to the point to where I, you know, I was at home by myself in my shorts and a t-shirt and not interacting with them. That was the biggest transition of everything. It wasn't the technology, it wasn't any of the rest of it. It was going from I'm in a shop joking with the guys to I'm by myself all day. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a transition. Now, when I started working for Chris Cloutier, uh, I've been working remote now four and a half years. This company auto text me. We've been full remote all the time. Now, Chris, did, was that more by design or by necessity with the software? Team? Even before COVID and everybody made fun of yes. me before COVID <laughs> and would say, dude, you can never have a remote team. That doesn't work. People won't work. So Craig, back in the early years, I was a developer and I told my bosses all the time, my brain doesn't shut on or start at nine and shut up at, off at five, right? So what I would do a lot of times is go home and I would work. I, I'm somebody who toils at night, especially coding. Everybody codes when you're a coder. A lot of coders actually code at night. It's just the way, you, I, I don't, don't know why. Some people like early in the morning. I liked it in the evening. So I would get very frustrated and say, look, I want to work, work remote. Um, I, cause my brain once again, turns on and turns off. So I said, whenever I have a software company, I I'm going to work remote and then COVID hit. Now everybody's remote and everybody's like, Oh, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> and I'm like, well, so, and I, and I also want to point out a couple of things. One is, is Chris, you know, Chris is talking about future and, and I, I got to make this point. I want to make this point. I want to make it, I'm probably going to make it a couple of times, right. You know, Chris is talking about, a, a you know, people not answering phones at shops anymore. Everybody going through an app, mm -hmm. like, um, whether or not we're going to have people or not, this will definitely happen, right? I mean, Chris is talking about future. It's the way it is. It's kind of like text message, text message, text, text messaging your customer. Seven, eight years ago, when I started auto text me, I was rejected by 99% of the shops that I went to. And now you'll read an article and I hear shop owners all the time that say, oh man, I'm innovative. I'm, I'm, I'm not texting my customers. And I'm like, nope, innovation was <laughs> nine, 10 years ago, right? Innovation is when nobody's doing it. You're, you're, you're Trump, you're a new path. 
nobody's cut the hedges. The road isn't clear. You're going into trees. You're going into everything else, right? So, you know, I want to make sure that we're talking about uncharted paths, which is cool. Chris is, you know, he's, he's got this remote service. He's got this whole thing. We've had pieces and parts. I know technology has definitely allowed us to get to this point now. Now we as owners have to get past this idea or thought that our people have to be at the front counter. I also want to bring up, you know, the, the robot that everybody saw at SEMA last you know, year that could, you know, put on tires and take them off, right? Robotics are going to mm. continue to evolve and grow in our industry, right? And one day you're going to replace your tire tech. One day, so this is innovation, right? So when we talk about innovation, innovation is tough. It's gross. It's weird, but it's taking chances, right? And taking those, you know, this ability to take chances on on things that may or may not be totally worked out yet, right? Point made, hopefully. Well, <laughs> and, and so don't, so I don't even know, don't get me started on the people that are still doing paper inspections or not doing any uh, inspections. And there are, there's still judging. people on paper SMSs that are still doing paper tickets. That still I, exists. I was, I was in Denver last week and you'd be shocked. Like I would, like, I've got it written down. Like um, one in five shops was still writing hand tickets yeah. and, and some of them were still using QuickBooks. And I'm just yeah. like, oh my gosh, there's going to be a time where, where me or Chris or somebody's going to have a repair, a repair facility or, or a repair business. Let's call it a business. Let's not call it a sure. shop or facility because that means somebody's going to have to come to you. Um, somebody's going to dial up on the phone. Like this is, this is happening now with Tesla. Like I know some of the, this is their job at Tesla. Like somebody calls in and they say, oh, I have, I'm having an issue. I'm having a charging issue. I'm having this issue. The technician gets in they, they interface with the car and they're like, oh, well, I see that, you know, they can tell you when you plugged it in, when you pulled it out, and they can tell you all the ways you're screwing up on your charging. And there's going to be a time where, where that's where we're at. Like, I'm not saying it's going to be here next year or, or two years from now, but at some point, the, the people that we leave behind in the industry, you're going to have a person that can program a car from 10,000 miles away, can look oh, yeah. at it. Yep. And, 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 but, but the other thing is, is you're going to call me like, say, um, say Craig calls me and is like, Hey, Chris, my lucid is not working. And I'm like, okay, I look in, I dial in and I'm like, Oh, okay. I see exactly what the problem is. Um, it's going to cost $975 to fix that. Here's the invoice. And I'm going to wait here while you enter your payment information and they're going to put their payment information. And then that person's going to go, okay, I'm interfaced with the car. I'm blah, blah, blah. I'm here. Uh, oh, it's done. You're good to go. Thank you. Is there anything else I can do with you? And that person is going to be sitting, gosh, I hope somewhere in the United States or whatever, but they could be a virtual assistant in Indonesia for all I know. Like there's like, you, like you could do that now if you wanted to. Chris, I, I came across this article and I, I mean, I'm totally, now I'm getting on my phone. I knew I should have had this ready and this is my lack of preparedness for this, for this meeting. But I sent this to my team this morning because I was sent by somebody else and it was an article on uh, The Verge and it talks about a, um, this company is called UVI. I'm going to oh. show you this. Makes AI powered diagnostic systems. So you'll, God, you can't see. I'll get the, oh, let's see, right there. From our email. Right there. Oh, see okay. that? Mm -hmm. Your car drives past through this thing, this dome thing, and this thing diagnoses your car. It looks at your tire. It looks at all kinds of things using uh, it. You just drive through and man, it's going to read and all your diagnostics, looking at your lights. It's, it's, it's insane, right? This is here, right? Um, it, it's just how we adopt it. And of course, let, let me wrangle us back into going back to the service ad, remote service advisor. Um, one of the other things I want to make a comment on was, you know, the inspections important, the, the cloud-based systems are important or VPM to get to your, your shop management systems important. And then add it on. We've started to use Loom, and I'm gonna. I got to give Greg Bunch credit for this um, Transformers Mastermind because he said this in one. He was like, "Why aren't we sending our sales presentations to customers?" So Colin has also been recording, not just "Hey, here's the DVI," but he goes through the DVI and then he says, "Look, to take care of all this is sixteen hundred bucks. If you want to text us and let us know that it's good to go." And 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 so Colin, I, I know one particular case we sent it to a fleet company. Uh, right. And they were like, this is great because the guy couldn't he wasn't going to be out on the phone. So he's like, man, this is great. Like, fix it. Right. Colin, what's your what's been kind of some of your experience with that? Um, yeah, that's it. It gives me a chance to still do the sale and present it rather than just building a ticket and sending it off where you still get a little bit of the personality and 
you know, obviously what I started with was customers that I've already had a relationship with. So it's not kind of a blank, hey, you know, because once again, we do have to train them. So I'm sending the customers I know, and then we were asking for their feedback. And that's what their feedback was, was this was nice. I didn't have to stop what I was doing to get on the phone. I was able to pull that email up when I had a chance, watch the minute and a half, two minute video, make a quick call or text into James or Cliff. And next thing you know, the job's going and it's done the next day. Um, and how, so how long did pretty good. How long did it take you to, to figure out Loom? It was minutes, right? It's it pretty was, good stuff. Yeah, it was. And once again, it was Chris's suggestion. Chris, like, hey, what do you think about this? And it's like, it was free to try. So we said, let's try it. Made a couple of videos. It was, it was, I mean, click, click here. Little thing pops up, shows your face. Okay, here's the DVI. Click record and just start going through it. Now, obviously, you have to be comfortable talking, you know, in front of, I guess, the, the webcam or what, what have you. But I mean, it was really easy. It's very simplistic. And then once we saw the benefit of it, we signed up for a year and now we're sending them off like crazy. And once well, and we condition the customers and they're retrained, they'll start really adopting it. But it's going to be a slow process like any kind of change where you have to kind of train your customers, just like we do with text messages, you know. But well, now if we don't text the customer, they're like, what? Why did you text me? What yeah. did you call me for? So Right. <laughs> Well, and, and so I've got, you know, I've got shops that, you know, we've tried to try to put it in all of them, but I've got shops that if you have um, customer drops their keys off in the key drop and the service advisor gets in, does a quick video, say, Hey, my name's Chris. I'm going to be uh, advising you today. Um, I just want to drop you a quick video, tell you, we've got your car in the tickets ready and it's going to go over to the technician and hit send. Boom. You can also on a lot of that stuff, you can track and see when the person watches it, which is awesome because you know if they're paying attention or not. Mm -hmm. And then within 10 or 15 minutes, the technician goes, he's on his phone and he's got it turned around and says like, hey, um, my name's Craig. I'm going to be the technician working on your vehicle today. Uh, I understand the immediate concern is X. We're also going to do a great inspection for you. And as soon as I get that done, I'm going to send it back over to Colin and then he'll follow up. Boom. Send it out. And so I challenge you. Everything we do is about the relationship and you can build the relationship better doing it this than you can in person. Love it. Cause it's their time when they can consume it, Chris versus your yep. time. I agree. Yep. Amen, brother. You're preaching. I Preach. I got like, like my hair standing up. I, don't even know. <laughs> I love your passion. It's like, this is me. Chris is, this is why you got to be named Chris, but y'all didn't want to change the name at the beginning. Let's look at it another way too, because we're thinking about the client here in this case. So let's also go back to thinking about our advisors again too. So technically, Colin, uh, this might be a good question for you because you could build those videos like a developer of software in the evenings. (laughs) Have you ever done this? Is this something that is taboo in your book? No, nothing's taboo. Um, Anything's available. Yeah, we could definitely work in evening hours to build tickets that weren't done. But usually at our shop, the way it comes in, we've got pretty, I don't want to say streamlined process, but to where they come in and by the time the car is there, it's diagnosed, it's getting built pretty much instantaneous quickly right away to get that turnaround going. Cause we turn, I don't know, Chris could give you the numbers and however many cars a day, I know. but can. <laughs> to, to pause that and put in the evenings, I mean, it's definitely a possibility, but I don't think we have the volume right now where that's an issue. And we I think we're able to get it done. During in our while. shop, the intake comes in, in the morning, Craig, you know, and, and people know we're, we're a busy shop. We, both shops are busy. They know you get in in the morning, you're going to drop off your car for a diag. And then, you know, so there's this window that, you know, me and Colin have kind of found where the, the tickets need to be written by the end. of. Nice. So the intake happens at the beginning. You might have some stragglers coming in and then anything comes in after a certain time, the production happens. Right. And that's when guys are working on cars. That's when you know, all the things, you know, and, and so getting those tickets built and getting those things sold is, is super important. So in the evenings, I'm not saying to roll that out um, because, you know. know, my philosophy and, and I'm, I'm going to say this and, and we don't have any, you know, regulation on cursing, but my whole philosophy in my businesses and this for the auto repair shops and the software company, it's get shit done, mm-hmm. right? If shit needs to get done, get it done. Like that's your job. Don't wait until yep. somebody like get it done, right? That's what mm-hmm. we're paid to do, right? So you know, well, but most where, of what we can do now is during the hours that, you know, we're finding, you know, Colin being that done. So when we, we don't lay the groundwork that big, for this yeah. conversation. Elon Musk was in the news again, uh, making headlines with with bringing people back to the office because you can't just develop things that are going to change the world by phoning things in. And I thought that sounded like antiquated technology, first and foremost. But here we are, we're finally at the point in this industry where the technology is there for us to get out of the office. And his critique seemed to be that like, 
it, a lack of trust that was going in. And as Rui's saying in chat, as we mentioned earlier, trust is a big component for remote work to be successful, but get shit done topic is, is exactly that. And what I've realized personally, four and a half years working remotely, uh, my workday, I have to make a conscious effort to stop <laughs> doing things because if there's stuff to be done, okay, it's easier to spend a few more minutes. And from every study I've looked at, that's a norm for any remote worker and for service advisors, I, I guess my question would be, and I think a fear for some of them would be, is it easy enough to turn off and be done with your day? And what I'm hearing from you, Colin, is that due to the way that the shop is currently designed, that's not a problem. No, it's not. That's that's something I've mentally built up myself being in this industry is I'm able to turn it off when that when we close our doors. Because for instance, like my wife, she doesn't 24 seven. Her phone goes off, she's always working. Chris, Cloutier, nonstop. The dude works 25 hours out of a 24 hour day. And me, I, I shut it off. I'm able to shut it off. But once again, I have no problem working the evening if that comes up. Once kids are in bed, hey, I sit down for an evening or for an hour, build a bunch of tickets, send off videos. That, that's not out of the realm of needed at all in the future. But I, I do have the mental capacity. I'm able to shut it off very easily. Well, yeah, cool. I mean, I mean, say, say that was an issue. Like you were so busy that one service advisor couldn't get it all done or two or whatever, and you couldn't get it done. Well, guess what? You can hire a service advisor remote or an estimator, like we've been talking about, in a different time zone. Yes. Maybe, maybe they Very work much. from, you know, um, so say you're on the East Coast and you hire somebody in California to write tickets for you eight hours a day in the afternoon and evening. And then the other people come in first thing in the morning. They're just like, boom, they're just like sending them out. Um, and, and I want to, to Chris's point, and he said this earlier, and I wanted to comment on this. So I, so I own a software company, I own auto repair shops. And, and this is a valid point that Chris made. Look, when he puts out an ad for a service, a remote service advisor, his talent pool just expanded to the US. So when it comes to the software company, I have, I, you know, Craig, I mean, we're, we, we, we have people working in eight different states because everybody's remote. When it comes to an auto repair shop, unfortunately, our talent pool is within that three to five to 10 miles, depending on how yeah, rural Because that commute be is there too. That's you it. can't commute Correct. an hour and a half to the shop and Correct. have a happy life. So I think Chris's point of this also opens up a possibility for you to have somebody if you're East Coast to hire somebody West Coast who you can trust, who has experience. Now, there's ways to know if people are getting shit done, right? If, if there's, you know, if we run 20 cars average per day per shop, right, and 35 of those tickets are built by Colin because some of the old changes and quick things are done, right? You can keep track of that, right? And the other thing we've also found is consistency of write-up and expectations. So now that Colin's managing the inspections and Colin's very good at, at needing information, he's going back and saying, hey, here's good inspections. Here's not so good inspections. How do we get these all to the same so I can present? And when I am presenting, it's more consistent to the customer across both shops and other technicians, right? Which I think is, is, is another important point of this because now he's the one kind of central place that's seeing all this information. And, and, and that well, is happening. We are we are seeing more consistency in the DVIs because when you have two different shops, you you still have the same procedures but slightly different strategies because the master tech over here is wanting this. So, so I'm able to kind of get that consistency done, and then also coach the guys up of, hey guys, you know I'm seeing this with here. Let's go ahead and do this. And next thing you know, next next week around, now they're a lot more similar. Plus, I'm able to change the verbiage of but once once again, it's more consistent product being delivered. Well, sure. and, and, and the key is, is like, this takes us back to processes and procedures, right? So if you're, if you're a shop owner and you don't like holding people accountable that are actually physically in the shop, then guess what? It's not, it's, it's just as easy to hold remote workers accountable as it is people in the shop, but you have to be in that mindset and you have to do it. You have to look and see what they're doing, um, actively mentor and coach them and be like, Hey, tell me what your struggles are. How can we make it better and keep moving forward? But if you, like, if you can't hold the people accountable in your shop, then that's a whole different topic, but you know. Agreed. And I agree that process you, you're and Craig, you kind of skipped over that. What tools do you need? Most of us are digital. A lot of shops that are probably watching this are digital, but that process is super important, right? And knowing when things happen at any given point in time, once again, the whole point of auto text me, the creation of that was so everybody knew in the workflow what was happening, right? That that was so when I first came in auto repair, it was just it's a dumpster fire, right? It, it's keys and paper flying everywhere and people running in and out. And I said, man, there's got to be a better way to manage. 
And the whole point was to stay on that workflow so everybody's collaborative, everybody understands where things are at. So the certain, certain things get done at the proper times. So it's almost like I'm, I'm getting this image of, of service advisors as something of a remote assistant in a way, almost like a gig uh, job. And one of the things, if anyone's ever thought of having an, a remote assistant or anything, one of the things you have to be able to lay down for an assistant is an exact process. You can't take someone and teach them what you need them to do 15 different times on a complex procedure. It has to be very cut and dried and very, very clear. I'm wondering if this is where, where this industry could go <laughs> from here. Service advisors taking remote gigs, working on a beach from anywhere for multiple different shops, seeing a, seeing a brave new future there. Well, you know, so one of the things that we've done at Service Up is like we already have remote service advisors on staff. We've got them across the country. Are they and, regional in their, in their um, clients or could the clients be from anywhere? The clients can be from anywhere. So we've, we've, got, um, we've got advisors in North Carolina, Texas, Arizona, and then West Coast. And, and they overlap and help each other out. But the other thing is, is we have, we have some people that want to work on the weekends. So we have weekend remote service advisors. We have people that want to work um, uh, the um, North Carolina guy. He wants to work from 10 to six. So he, you know, he, that's his hours. And then, and then we go through, but the, you know, one of the things that we can provide is we can provide a great remote service advisor staff to you and integrate with your stack. Um, and then plus the technology we have. So say a shop owner was like the, the only shop owner or the only person in their business, they were smaller and they wanted to take a week vacation. How cool would it be to call us up and have us write tickets for you remotely for a week and still have all your technicians there and working? Um, it, you we know, have a question come in too on this, That's Chris. Awesome. Uh, That's awesome. Uh, Bradford asks, how are you recording phone calls? Uh, this goes to accountability for that individual. Yeah, so all so our phone system, like everything comes in, but a lot of stuff comes in digitally. So you can get a text record, you can right. get an email record, and then and then all of our all of our incoming and outgoing phone calls are are recorded. But I will tell you, um, we've been really, really lucky in the people that we've hired, mainly because we've been able to get like a hundred rock stars of you know looking for the job. But our average repair order is over nine hundred dollars. So if you if you're if your shop, if you're like five hundred dollars. And, you know, people beat me up all the time. Like, well, how do I know you're any better? How do I know this? Well, <laughs> let's, let's look at GP and average repair order. Like, so, so the other thing is where we're different than say repair pal is we don't take 15% of your ticket. We take what we make, we take what you give us and then we charge the difference to the customer. And that's how we make our money. Now, if you called us up and said, Chris, I'm going to Jamaica for, for a week and I need somebody to do that. Then we'll take five to 7% of the ticket. Cause in that, you know, in that instance, we're doing the service advising for you in lieu of you having to pay somebody else. Interesting. Now, where, where would a shop, if they're interested in service up, have to go in order to participate with the program? You can go to, to serviceup.com and sign up to be a partner shop. Uh, you can email me, Chris, at serviceup.com. Um, I try to separate all my coaching business from the service up side of it. That way, through separate entity, uh, right? Through a separate entity. Yeah. And, and, you know, send me an email, say, Chris, I want to talk to somebody else about this. I want to learn more. Again, like I said, we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're in Phoenix. Um, uh, we're soft launching Denver. We're going to be in 25 cities by the end of the year. Uh, and I'm telling you now, get signed up now, get learn about it now, because when we hit your city, uh, you're going to want to be the first people on there. And you talked about the, the, the gig workers a little bit, and some people may not understand, but um, you know, we have partnerships with, with very big gig companies and we can bring those customers to your door without you paying a penny for it. Like you, like you're not paying us for that, for the advertising. Um, we have what's called work perk programs where we go to the work or the remote office or their house and bring it in. And we've got a lot of other stuff that's very interesting that we're working on. Um, how cool would it be if you could not only get, um, work from uh, rideshare drivers, but what if in the rideshare app, all of their riders could click on it and schedule service for their own cars and we could bring those to you. And so those are some things that we can do because we've, you know, uh, we just closed our series A, we've got money, we're doing things that most independent small shops can't do. They can't have somebody spend six to eight months developing that relationship. So anyway, again, awesome. I'll shut up. 
No, I, I think that's a fascinating. Uh, very neat. Very neat. Very, very neat. Very neat. Now let's, let's talk more about the, the clients that we're dealing with remotely. We touched on it briefly earlier. Colin, you mentioned very specifically uh, that certain types of clients, but what types of characteristics, if you're engaging someone remote, you're using those Loom videos, what sort of characteristics are you specifically looking for? Just a familiar face, younger audience? No, it's still, we're still trying to gather that. I mean, originally the first couple of times were customers that already had a relationship with that knew me personally. So, you know, it was not an issue. Now it's just a little bit more broadband, you know, now if they, like for instance, my Wiley shop today wrote a particular on an O2 Lexus. It was once I priced everything, I was like $12,000. I'm not going to make a video for that and go through a laundry list of the 800 little things that we <laughs> see on there. Tell us to be 12 because it's not going to be beneficial. It's going to be an overload. Yeah. So you just kind of, it's kind of a judgment call. You find ones that, Hey, here's two or three car that came with two or three key items. Here's a good one. You don't want to overwhelm them with a huge ticket um, where, you know, the technician wrote up everything in the world. That's kind of what I've been going at now lately. But it started at people I knew, and now it's transitioned to tickets that seem to be not overwhelming, but, you know, here's what they brought it in for. Here's a couple other things we noticed. Here you go. You're still having that conversation with people mm -hmm. in most cases, though, is what I'm hearing. Oh, uh, it's a one-sided conversation. Oh, but with the at videos, the of course yes, it is. at the counter, they are Correct. still having, yes. Yes, at yes, yep. the counter there. Interesting. So I'd, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about how we don't lose things in translation from that drop-off point to you. Is that just something your team's really good at taking those notes and making sure you have all those details? We talk consultative advising all the time where we're listening to that relational element of it. And service up advisor would have to be able to do the same thing, understanding how a vehicle is being used, understanding what's important. Does that person have kids? All those sort of things. Are, are we collecting those details? Is that something your CSR is trained at? We're definitely collecting a lot of the details. I don't know if it'd go to extensive as like you're saying of, you know, do you take it for the kids, this and that, but we know what they brought it in for. We have a general idea um, because of the area we're in of what, what the car is being used for, for the most part. So it's not, it's not blind, but we do take very good notes of check-in. Um, it's not just, I hear a noise. Okay. Heard a noise. You're right. no, it's a hear a noise from the front left wind turning at low speeds, you know, when I'm dropping my kid off at school, stuff like that. So we do take very concrete notes up front um, at check-in and then, I guess on the backside, the guys, if they have a question, well, what did exactly did Colin say when he presented it? They can go back and watch that video as well and make sure the verbiage was correct. Because, you know, as you guys know, you always build a little bit of an out. You got to replace and retest, you know, so you want to make sure that that original sale, because sometimes you don't want pass off have between that original sale. You can go back and look at the actual verb and you go, okay, this is what he said. Okay, so yeah, when Colin presented that video to you, you know, he mentioned this, this, this. Now we replaced this. Now we found that this, this, this. See, so it's a continuation and not necessarily dropping anything off. It's, I don't want to say pass off, but it, it still flows, if that makes sense. No. Without being too confusing and cloudy there. No. No. Now, what other measures of success are we actually looking at on this? I know Chris watches the numbers very closely across the board. I imagine this is becoming a new metric or will become a new metric. Are we looking for a certain ARO? Are we looking to just see a level of satisfaction with the clients, reviews? What what areas would you guys look at? Man, that's client? great, Craig. And and so we've been doing this for a couple months now. And what I like to do is is sometimes ready, fire, aim, throw something <laughs> out there, figure out what it is, and then figure out how to, you know, look at to measure it. So so and I'll tell you this, and for everybody listen, I am a numbers guy. I like budgets. I like forecasts. I know about BNL. I know a balance sheet. But numbers now are not true just because of the way that the world has gone. It's, it's very hard to – AROs are through the roof right now. Uh, customers are fixing, still fixing everything right now because there's no alternative. Um, so there will be a measure of, of – but – it's very, you know, things are in, in flux still because of the state of affairs when it comes to shops right now. Uh, that's the best way I can put it. I can't tell you we're going to raise our AO because our AO is through the roof right now. It's yeah, the highest no. it's ever been yeah. um, because once again, that person with the $3,000 car is fixing the $3,000 worth of work. And we're still seeing that in Texas, we just hit a hundred degree plus weather starting a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, it hasn't stopped, which means that we've been blindingly busy. So right now, the only thing is, is Colin building tickets. How many is he building? Is he getting done? You know, these, the, you know, getting this, these tickets out. Um, and it's funny because I talked to the other side of the shop and one of the problems that they're having is Colin's sometimes delivering the information too quickly back to them. <laughs> because now if they had, we have seven bays, if seven cars get written up 
It goes to Colin. Colin's able to chew them up, spit them out. And now you're sending out text messages to seven customers saying, hey, give us a call. Man, you know, they don't ever call like one at a time. It's seven people calling at the same time <laughs> trying to, you know, so you're managing that as well. So that's why we're trying the video stuff to see if we can offload some of that, you know, that interaction. So the service advisor at the counter doesn't have to necessarily, you know, interact with that because that it can be painful. Oh, that's interesting insight because obviously there's processes in place to make this successful, but it's also going to be informing new processes to make it yes. more and more successful. And I'll tell you, Craig, one thing that I, I have found that I'm able to help facilitate both shops in that anybody that's ever written service for can understand is I deal with the aftermarket warranty companies because <laughs> I can sit here at home for 30 or 40 minutes on hold, still build other tickets while I'm waiting for these guys to get on the phone and not take the resources of the guys at the shop because that's a huge time suck, as we all know. Right. Oh, so that, awesome. that helps yeah. hugely to take that off the guy's shoulders there at the shop. Fascinating. Uh, no, I think that that's awesome. Um, the, the, I wanted to go back and say like, how do you measure success? I, I think in the end, the big thing is, is are the customers happy and are they doing it? Are they, are they kicking back against it? And what we found is the, the customers are happy. They're fine. You know, we got rid of, uh, emailing for texting because you know people were we could see when they looked at the text we know that their response rates are quicker um and we are communicating regardless of how long you've been in the business and what you think we are communicating with customers the way they want to be communicated with um yeah and and to jump back for just a second uh it's like the wild wild west for repair right like i could go I could go into Denver and probably start 50 new shops right now. And it would make a dent in most people's because there's so much, you know, people are two, three, four weeks out and it's just insane. But what I think is going to happen. And, and if, if anybody's followed me, they know I've been talking about this for six, eight months. I thought we were going to have a recession next year about October. Looks like it's going to hit a year early. Um, what I know about the industry being in it for 30 years is as gas prices go up, car count goes down. That hasn't happened yet, um, which is interesting. But the other thing is, is I think as an industry, we're going to have to make sure that we have alternative forms of payment because we're going to happen. We're going to hit a credit crunch and people are not going to be able to pay for their repairs. And that's when we're going to suffer as an industry. Um, because we're, people will still be repairing because new vehicles are out of the equation. Yeah. 72% um, of all vehicles sold last year were used vehicles. Think about that for a minute. You can't yeah. buy new ones. Yeah. Right? Let's go all buy electric cars. Let's not get political on this. Nah, I didn't yeah, mean to yeah, say that. No, we're good. Right? Yeah. Because <laughs> that'll solve the problem. Yeah. Right. Well, for, for, yeah. No, we know that. And everybody in the audience is now going, oh my God, did he say that? Right. Because <laughs> there's the reality versus the, you know. Versus, well, let's, let's uh, answer a question here from one of the audience. Uh, they asked about what is the range of pay for a remote service advisor and what background of folks have you seen? that are the best at this role if you can't find an experienced advisor? So I'll, I'll take it first. And then Chris has a lot more experience with this. So, so we've talked, you know, me and Colin have talked about this. And, and so we've, we've talked about reduction in hours, but he's still getting the same hourly rate because we very much feel that he's worth, it's the knowledge that we're paying for. It's all. So other than a reduction in hours in, in, in August, and just to let y'all know in August is when, you know, he, he wants this time in the mornings and the afternoon. So mm -hmm. we're going to kind of condense this time to get these things done during this time, which shouldn't be a problem. Right. So didn't, didn't, and what is he paying? I, we pay our service advisors anywhere from starting $15 an hour, you know, up to, you know, 30 plus dollars an hour at, at golden rule is where we're at. So which one thing Chris does too, is we're not, we're not um, commission. We're straight salary, right? straight salary. And then so, at the end of the year, we pay a bonus uh, based off of net profit. And, and that way everybody's watching expenses. A lot of people do it off of gross profit. We do it off of net. Um, but you know, it keeps everybody honest from that new equipment, whatever you can amortize that or depreciate over time, but that's just the way we do it. Yes. So we still encourage a group think, when it comes to that, I wouldn't put a $15 an hour guy at home working remote right now. I, I would not do that. Um, so I, I, once again, I think this is going to take from what I have, Colin's marked. He's been, Chris said this at the beginning, he's been with us for 11 years. Colin's very much invested in it. When he came to me, he said, Chris, I could leave. I can go get a part-time job. And I said, let's give this a try. Right. And, and once again, it, it, 
it's awesome, right? I've known other shops that have done this. I have known other industries, you know, or other um, MSOs that have done this and done it very well. Well, so so the good thing is, is we're also able to work with um, uh, a service advisor's time frame. Like if you want to work, if you want to work three 12 hour days or in one four hour day, if you want to work um, four tens, um, right now we're starting out about $70,000 a year for about 40 hours a week and depending on the hours and whatever. Um, so, you know, it just depends, but the other, the good thing, or the kind of thing that the thing that I chuckle at, right. Is when I do this, there's a, an insanely proportionate amount of dealer people with dealer experience versus independent doing this. So we're able to pull a lot of people from dealerships away from dealerships into the independent world or into what we're doing to help independents out. And, and let's be honest, a lot of those people are trained really, really well. They're good with technology and they're used to processes and procedures. So they fit into our system really, really well. And we've done some great things with those people. Nice. Well, guys, we're nearing our time limit here for today. This has been great. I, I love how you guys are building off each other and, and carrying the conversation forward. Uh, I think this is a conversation a lot of people will be eager to have. Uh, Chris Cotton, I hope you get uh, some, some feedback with service up as well. Uh, would you like to make any closing remarks and then we'll go around and start with you, Chris Cotton? Um, the first thing I would do is challenge you, whatever you think you know about the auto repair industry, it's changed in the last 18 months and whatever we're going to do in the next 18 to two months, or 18 months to 24 months, you can either jump on the train and ride with us, or you can be stuck doing paper inspections like everybody else. And so it's, it's up to you, you know, don't fight it. Just, you know, learn, get over your mindset and move on. Uh, I am going to be in Phoenix this weekend um, at the Sunrise Automotive event. I'm teaching a class. Um, if any of you out there from Phoenix, I'd love to see you. If you're, if you're coming to that event and not going to the class, then catch me at the vendor time or anything else. And again, just be open. Wonderful. Colin. Um, no, it's been a lot of fun. This is my first webinar uh, with you guys. So it's been a lot of fun. I'm just, I'm grateful for the opportunity. Like I said, that Chris came up with this concept of, Hey, let's try this and see what we can do. You know, because once again, I didn't want to leave something that I've helped build from the ground up. Chris didn't want to lose me as a resource. As, and not to mention that we've been, you know, great friends for 20 years as well. But it was, it was an opportunity. And I'm, I'm very grateful that him and Pat have allowed me to do this, which makes me, keeps me from having to go work part time down the street somewhere than doing something I don't want to do that I'm not good at. Um, so, yeah, just really grateful. It's been a lot of fun. One more question for you, Colin. Sure. Would this even even as a part time thing be something you recommend to other advisors? Absolutely. If your situation dictates, for sure. Like I said, with my situation, it was one of those things where my hand was forced. Um, so yeah, it's not that I don't, I dislike being at the shop. You know, I, I enjoy being in the shop with the guys doing that, but yeah, this is definitely a great opportunity to be able to do what I'm very, very good at, be able to help the company as well and still, you know, continue to be profitable for everybody. Nice. I'd like to see the people with your skills stay in the industry. So that's wonderful. Thank you, Colin. Great job. Thank you. Chris Cloutier. Uh, yeah. So failure is not final, right? I, that's one of the quotes I love in, 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 right. Nor is it fatal. So we, in, to piggyback on what Chris said, right. We have to attempt to try these new things and find these new things out and, and keep an open mind to what the future will bring. Yes. Having people work remote is scary, hundred percent, but it's typically scary because it's unknown. We think people aren't going to do their job, but nobody ever wakes up in the morning. No employee ever wakes up in the morning saying, I'm going to suck today. Every employee wants to deliver. They want to do well. Right. So I agree. Keeping that open mind, keeping the look at future, what's on the horizon, what are things that are possible? I will go to DVI and texting, right? This is why that you want to be in technology because without it, you can't do this. You can't leverage these things. If you're not willing to move forward with the tools that are already out there, you won't even have this opportunity. And this is one of those reasons why you need to continue to push forward into technology, right? Because it allows you, it allows a lot of different opportunities. It allows a lot of different things to open up. Uh, Chris's Cotton's, when he talked about having shops that don't even answer the phone, that's amazing, right? They're texting and all, I mean, but one day, what is it going to look like, right? I mean, all we can do is look to Star Wars and all the 
futuristic <laughs> movies and that's probably what we're going to be living in in, in pure honesty so uh, correction star wars was a long time ago yeah. sorry it was a long time ago. <laughs> so in a galaxy far far away <laughs> yes <you're> right <laughs> yeah. um i appreciate um craig you you putting this on um craig just let everybody know he's been a trainer with auto text me he is the vp of training for auto text me he's a wonderful person he's very smart and he shops out there and need help when i have this conversation with craig he did not do an intro um so i'll do one for you craig ah, thank and, you. and just want to thank chris cotton and, and colin as well thank for you guys yeah, being no, on here chris cotton colin i thanks for having time me out of your busy days and folks yes i've been remote four and a half years after working 20 years in a shop if you need to know what it's like uh, to transition to remote life. There are some other challenges that do come with it. Always happy to talk about the experience. And frankly, I just look forward to seeing uh, people starting to post those job ads on Indeed saying remote work and attracting talent from all over the country, because I know that that's becoming a possibility. I hope you all keep your minds open to it. Thank you for joining us today. This webinar will be posted on YouTube for further consumption. We'll put links in the description here so you can learn more about Service Up, learn more about Loom and some of the great things that we've been talking about. Thanks for watching. Thanks, guys.